Good morning, everyone. I'm Senior Vice Chancellor Mike Duffy at the Ohio Department of Higher Education, formerly uh, eight-year member of the Ohio House of Representatives, so legislator. I want to thank Dr. Tom Harnish from SHEO, uh, which is our peer-to-peer -peer organization for the Ohio Department of Higher Education, for the Departments of Education in many of your states, or if you're Michigan and you don't have a department, you end up with someone like Dan Hurley uh, that represents Michigan at SHEO. But these peer-to-peer -peer organizations are really important. This is where we share information about what's going on, what we're proposing for the next budget, hide the ball a little bit, don't tell other states what we're going to do, want to know what they're going to do, um, uh, use leverage, you know, uh, notice what Michigan's doing right now, which is really remarkable in higher education, has been impactful for us in the um, state of Ohio. If you're a legislator, however, your peer-to-peer -peer organization are entities like NCSL or Council of State Governments, and that leads us to our next speaker, uh, as Midwest Director for CSG, Mike McCabe leads 11 people doing research and support. If you're a legislator like State Representative John Cross, you're working on growing and retaining Ohio's workforce, the GROW Act, which has tax incentives, you may want to know, have other states done something similar to this? So Mike McCabe is the, the guy from the Midwest to ask those questions. Before joining CSG, uh, Mr. McCabe works as an attorney in Des Moines, Iowa. He is a graduate of Iowa State and received his Juris Doctorate at the University of Illinois. Uh, Ohio is kicking off lame duck season right now, and we're going to be very active over the next month. Uh, here with us to reflect on all Midwestern states and all of the activity legislatively that's happening together with a preview for 2023 is Mike McKay. Well, thank you, Mike, and good morning, everybody. It's truly a pleasure for me to be here with you all again. Um, for those who don't know, um, the Council of State Governments provides staff support to a number of different uh, regional and national networks of state officials. The main one that my office works with support out of uh, Chicago is a, a network called the Midwestern Legislative Conference, which includes all 1,550 state legislators from across the Midwestern states. And it was that organization, the Midwestern Legislative Conference, that originally developed and worked to secure passage of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact more than 30 years ago. So that means that I should start my presentations by saying, I guess, hi, I'm Mike, and I'm a mechaholic. <laughs> I, I was at the first MEC commission meeting more than 30 years ago, and I think I've been to all but one or two since, and I think Randy Furlick has me beat, but uh, I am a frequent flyer here and always enjoy coming to take part in your meetings and to learn about what you all are working on. Uh, so thank you for the chance to be here again today, this year. Thank you to Susan and my friends on the MEC staff. Uh, thank you again, Mike, for your introduction, and thank you to our Ohio hosts for putting this meeting together. <laughs> My purpose, as always, is to present an overview of recent developments on, uh, in the public policy arena across the Midwest, uh, looking primarily at recent developments in the legislative front. And um, I'll also, of course, uh, provide a recap of last week's election results. I know you're eager to hear about that. And we'll take a look uh, ahead as we go and also at the end uh, to the legislative sessions in 2023 in hopes that this sort of broad overview of the public policy arena will inform your thinking about the work that you do. My presentation is never specific to, to education or higher education, but I'll certainly touch on it and hope that that context is useful to you. I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to jump in. And uh, fair warning, my tendency is to substitute uh, blinding speed for careful editing. So here we go. Um, <laughs> 2022 has been another interesting year across the Midwest, and in the next few minutes, I'll highlight some of the recent legislative and political developments that made it noteworthy in one way or another. But in thinking about the past 12 months as a whole, the thing that most stands out in my mind is the extent to which 2022 was more of an ordinary year. That isn't to say that it didn't have its moments, but when you think about all that we've been through since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic more than two and a half years ago, it's nice to look back on the past year and realize that in some ways, our public lives at least, are returning to something closer to normal. In the state public policy arena, that, that was apparent when our legislatures went back to work in January, free for the most part from many of the COVID-related safeguards and operational changes that necessarily characterized the 2021 legislative sessions. 
The substantive agendas across the Midwest certainly changed as well, with pandemic-related emergency measures gradually giving way to the kinds of issues that more typically populate uh, legislative calendars. As usual, during the second year of a biennium, this year's legislative sessions were a bit shorter than they typically are in odd-numbered years. And with last week's midterm elections looming on the horizons, election year dynamics certainly helped to shape their course as well. At the same time, our states were mostly doing very well fiscally, thanks in large part to the huge influx of federal dollars that left states awash in money and far better prepared to face an uncertain economic future than we might have imagined just two years ago when all the arrows were pointing down and no one knew where the pandemic might take us. Since the economy and budgets ultimately impact everything that happens in the policy arena, let me start there with a quick look at the economic and fiscal landscape across the Midwest. It's been a mixed bag on the economic front this year with good reason for concern about the health and future of the nation's economy, but also some signs of resilience and continued strength. After six straight quarters of growth following the COVID crash of 2020, real GDP declined at an annualized rate of 1.6% during the first quarter of this year and by 0.6% in the second quarter. This led to a somewhat tortured and frequently politicized debate about whether or not the economy was approaching or perhaps was already in a recession. More recently, GDP growth appears to be growing again at an annualized rate of 2.6%, according to preliminary estimates released by the BEA in late October. Personal income and consumer spending were both up last month, but the personal savings rate declined. And of course, inflation remains alarmingly high at an annualized rate of 7.7% in October, down from a June high of 9.1%, but still outpacing recent gains in household income. The core consumer price index, which excludes volatile food and energy prices, also retreated a bit last month, dropping to 6.3%. But these declines probably aren't enough to deter the Fed from continuing to raise interest rates in the near term. Recent increase in the federal funds rate have driven borrowing costs to highs we haven't seen in years, as illustrated by the average rate on a 30-year fixed mortgage, which is now hovering at about 7% compared to less than half that number just a year ago. Nevertheless, the job market remains strong, and the U.S. unemployment rate remains low at just 3.7%, even after an October increase over September's 29-month low of 3.5%. Across the country, state GDP rates dropped in 40 of the 50 states during the second quarter of this year, including all 12 MEC states. But personal income grew in every state in the nation, with North Dakota leading the way at 10.9% and four Midwestern states outpacing the national growth rate of 5.8%. State unemployment rates in September <clears throat> ranged from a regional and national low of 2% in Minnesota uh, to a regional high of 4.5% in Illinois, which was second only to D.C.'s rate of 4.7% nationally, with nine MEC states posting rates that were lower than the national rate. And compared to a year ago, total non-farm employment rose in 49 of the 50 states through September, including every state in the Midwest. Of course, official unemployment rates don't necessarily tell the whole story since they don't count the underemployed or the discouraged workers who have effectively dropped out of the workforce and are no longer looking for jobs. By some estimates, more than five and a half million Americans who want jobs are among the 100 million Americans not included in the official workforce count. So it's always a good idea to take the official unemployment numbers with a grain of salt when assessing the overall health of the economy. Third quarter GDP rates for individual states have not yet been published, but it's reasonable to expect that they will reflect the projected national increase for the same period. Despite these mixed signals on the economic front, the fiscal condition of our states remains strong in most cases, thanks in part, as I mentioned earlier, to the impact of ARPA and other federal relief funds deployed in the wake of the pandemic. Buoyed by these resources, total state revenues grew by 3.2% in FY22, down from the stimulus inflated rate of 16.5% in FY21, but still healthy nonetheless. Here in the Midwest, where revenues grew by almost 28% in FY21, they actually declined a bit in FY22 by 2.4%, 
but both nationally and regionally, total revenues are expected to grow again by just under 1.5% in FY23. Meanwhile, total state spending grew again in FY22 by 13.6% nationally and by a slightly lower rate of 10.5% here in the Midwest. Based on a preliminary analysis of FY23 budget enactments by the National Association of State Budget Officers, spending is expected to grow again by the end of the current fiscal year to the tune of 4.2% nationally and by as much as 7.5% here in the Midwest, with Medicaid, education, and corrections, again, among the most significant cost drivers. Overall, the outlook for state budgets remains strong with revenues consistently outpacing projections in most Midwestern states. And with the cumulative fund balances having recovered or exceeded their pre-pandemic levels. Nationwide, state rainy day fund balances are expected to reach 11.4% of spending by the end of FY24, with Midwestern reserves totaling 10.2% of expenses. So we're better in better shape than we expected with respect to the future. That isn't to say that there aren't challenges on the fiscal front as well, including the impact of inflation, continuing supply chain issues, and the possibility of another economic recession, among others. It's also worth noting that federal funds accounted for more than 40% of total state spending in FY21, but those ARPA and other federal relief funds won't last forever, and ultimately state budget makers will need to adjust accordingly. Still, states find themselves, as I said, in much better position on the fiscal front uh, and well prepared to face whatever comes next. Next, let's turn to this year's legislative sessions, which, as I noted earlier, more nearly resembled the pre-pandemic sessions of previous years than they did the COVID-interrupted sessions of 2020 or the COVID-restricted sessions of 2021. As the year began, a few of our states still had unfinished business to tend to with respect to redistricting, and most still had ARPA funds to deploy and budgets to pass um, all while addressing myriad other issues and challenges along the way. And of course, 2022 was an election year, which meant that politics were never far from the forefront uh, as this year's legislative sessions continued. Let's take a closer look at some of the key issues and concerns that eventually had the greatest impact on this year's sessions. I'll start with taxes, or more precisely, uh, tax cuts, since almost every state in the Midwest flush with cash, as pre previously noted, either considered or passed some sort of tax cut this year. In Iowa, for example, lawmakers approved a plan to replace the state's graduated income tax system with a new flat tax at an eventual rate of 3.9% by 2026. The new law, which also eliminates retirement income from taxation, makes Iowa the region's fourth state to implement a flat income tax rate. The others are Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. Elsewhere around the region, Nebraska approved a reduction in the top rate in its graduated income tax system from 6.84% to 5.84% by 2027. And Indiana lawmakers voted to reduce the Hoosier State's flat rate from 3.23% to 3.15% starting next year. The Nebraska measure will also reduce that state's corporate income tax rate. The Illinois General Assembly approved an expansion in that state's earned income tax credit, while lawmakers in Kansas voted to eliminate their state's sales tax on groceries, among other cuts. A $4 billion tax relief bill failed to reach the finish line in Minnesota, where budget conferees were unable to reach final agreement on a comprehensive tax and spending package before their session ended. But lawmakers in Missouri approved the tax package uh, during a fall special session that included an extension of some ag tax credits and a reduction in the state's top income tax rate from 5.3% to 4.5% over the next few years. With most states continuing to enjoy strong fiscal positions going into FY23, additional tax cuts are sure to be considered again next year. In North Dakota, for example, lawmakers are poised to consider a plan unveiled this summer that would replace the state's five-tier graduated income tax system with the nation's lowest flat tax at just 1.5%. If approved, the move would be the largest income tax reduction in state history. Next, let's look at education, which was the subject of legislative attention in several states again this year, especially at the K-12 level. K-12 
Pandemic fueled teacher shortages plaguing schools across the country led to legislative action in several Midwestern states, including Illinois, where a new law will allow retired teachers to return to the classroom for up to 140 days per year without interrupting their pensions. In Minnesota, a similar measure will allow retired teachers to return to teaching in public schools until 2026 without jeopardizing their retirement income. Nebraska lawmakers pursued a different strategy to ease teacher shortages when they approved a loan forgiveness program that provides qualified teachers with $5,000 per year in loan repayment assistance for up to five years. And a pending measure in Ohio would allow military veterans to teach in public schools without the training and experience usually required to receive an educator's license. Other K-12 measures of note this year included an Illinois measure to limit the use of standardized assessments at the early elementary level, a Missouri bill providing additional state funding for charter schools, and an Ohio measure earmarking $100 million for grants to enhance school safety and security. You are all certainly uh, more familiar with the higher ed arena than I am, but I'll at least mention a few of the relevant higher education measures that were considered this year as well. Just last month in Michigan, Governor Whitmer signed a new law that aims to lower the cost of higher education in that state by providing annual scholarships to any student whose family demonstrates financial needs on the FAFSA. Under the new Michigan Achievement Scholarship Program, students can receive up to $2,750 annually for community college and up to $5,500 per year if they're attending public universities. Meanwhile, lawmakers in Ohio approved a measure requiring state universities to establish free speech policies on campuses. And in a nod to the continuing debate over the teaching of critical race theory, South Dakota lawmakers approved a bill limiting the ability of colleges and universities to address divisive concepts like institutional racism in the classroom. A similar measure was also approved in Wisconsin, but was later vetoed by the governor there. Next, social issues. A variety of hot button social issues also appeared on Midwestern legislative agendas this year, including perennial topics like abortion and guns, but also a few subjects of more recent attention like the uh, regulation of transgender athletes. Abortion was already on the minds of the region's legislators even before the US Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade in late June. By then, lawmakers in Nebraska had already taken up a proposed ban on abortions in that state, but the measure ultimately stalled and did not pass. But it was after the Dobbs decision overturning Roe that the abortion debate took off in several of our states. Notably, the Ohio Attorney General urged a federal district court to lift an injunction that had previously prevented the 2019 heartbeat bill from taking effect here in this state, and that request was granted. Then following a contentious midsummer special session, Indiana became the first state in the nation to pass new abortion restrictions in the post dobbs era. The new Indiana law bans most abortions with exceptions for rape, incest, and to protect the life of the mother. But the news that best illustrated the deep divide on this issue and arguably, arguably presaged the outcome of last week's elections in several states came out of Kansas, where in early August, voters overwhelmingly rejected a legislatively, legislatively referred proposal premised on the notion that the Kansas Constitution does not create or secure a right to abortion. And I'll just say that uh, we will certainly hear more about this issue in the year to come with states uh, on both sides of, of the issue uh, addressing, the, addressing it again in 2023. Various proposals loosening restrictions on firearms were also considered this year, including a new law making Indiana a permitless carry state, meaning that gun owners no longer need permits to carry concealed guns, and an Iowa law allowing deer hunters to use semi-automatic rifles during a specified hunting season. <laughs> The proposed repeal of Nebraska's concealed carry permit requirement failed to win passage, but lawmakers in Ohio approved a proposal that will, with local approval, allow teachers to carry guns in their classrooms. And finally, at least four Midwestern states joined several others nationally in considering proposed bans or restrictions on the ability of transgender athletes to compete in interscholastic sports. Indiana and Iowa both adopted measures banning transgender girls from competing in K-12 girls sports, although neither measure applies to transgender boys. Similar measures were also introduced but did not pass in Kansas and South Dakota. 
With all the attention focused on elections and voting in recent years, it probably isn't surprising that various proposals related to election administration uh, were also considered or approved in states across the Midwest this year. In Missouri, for example, lawmakers approved a sweeping proposal that requires voters to produce voter photo IDs when voting, allows two weeks of early in-person voting, bans the use of ballot drop boxes, and prohibits touchscreen voting machines. Kansas lawmakers adopted a measure expanding post-election audits, requiring poll books to be certified by the Secretary of State, and requiring all paper ballots to be embedded with distinctive watermarks to help ensure their security. In Wisconsin, where the state Supreme Court ruled in July that ballot drop boxes are illegal, the governor vetoed several election-related measures that he believed would have made voting more difficult. And lawmakers here in Ohio appear ready to take up a proposed photo ID requirement for voters when the legislature reconvenes for its lame duck session, session uh, this month. As you'll hear shortly, several other Midwestern states um, considered proposed election reforms uh, by means of ballot measures that were considered by voters last week, and I'll come back to those shortly. Of course, there were many, many other issues on legislative agendas this year, and here in lightning round form are, is a brief recap of some of them. Criminal justice, a bail reform bill regulating the activities of charitable bail organizations was one of several criminal justice measures passed in Illinois this year, or in Indiana, I'm sorry. Illinois lawmakers passed a bill to create the offense of organized retail crime in an effort to curb so-called smash mob thefts in retail stores. And the Missouri legislature adopted the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights to help protect the victims of certain sexual crimes. Michigan, Minnesota, and Illinois were among states to consider uh, various incentive programs designed to help recruit and retain mental health workers in an effort to address shortages in that field. Ag and natural resource measures of various kinds were taken up in several states. Minnesota, for example, approved a measure to provide financial assistance to livestock farmers and specialty crop producers impacted by last year's drought. Nebraska lawmakers approved the governor's plan to divert water from the South Platte River in Colorado to reservoirs in Nebraska. You can imagine how well that's going over in Colorado, uh, but that was arguably uh, permissible, permissible under an uh, interstate compact that dates back, dates back to 1923 between those two states. Iowa passed a bill requiring most gas stations in the state to offer fuel blends containing higher levels of ethanol, and there were many others. Housing, the Kansas legislature passed a pair of bipartisan bills significantly increasing the state's investment in affordable housing and, and incentivized the private development of new housing projects. And several states enacted measures to expand or create new economic and workforce development initiatives this year. I could give you a list, but it would include most of the states. COVID benefits and restrictions were not past the pandemic yet, and in a sign that it's still with us, several, several states considered or approved measures designed in some way to address COVID-related concerns. For example, Illinois passed a bill providing paid leave to school employees who are fully vaxxed but miss work anyway due to COVID. And Minnesota approved a measure providing workers' comp protect, protections for employees who get sick while working. Lawmakers in Wisconsin passed a bill that would have banned vaccine mandates, but that measure was vetoed by the governor. And again, there were others around the region. Sports betting, uh, an increasingly popular issue on legislative agendas. Just for example, Kansas lawmakers approved a measure this year legalizing sports betting, and several other states are likely to consider similar proposals again next year. I have to mention the subject of impeachment. In South Dakota, the legislature there held two special sessions this year, the first in April, during which the House voted to impeach the state's attorney general for his involvement in the 2020 death of a man he hit while driving his car. Then in June, the Senate convened for his trial and convicted him, resulting in his becoming the first constitutional officer in the state's history to be removed from office by means of impeachment. A couple of other miscellaneous notes, Michigan and Minnesota enacted measures to help combat the opioid crisis and Iowa passed a bill to make the financial exploitation of elders a criminal offense. And just one more. In a victory for carnivores everywhere, oh my God. Kansas lawmakers passed a bill prohibiting grocery stores from labeling plant-based patties <laughs> as burgers. That's a huge step in the right direction. 
<laughs> and with that bit of truth and advertising as a segue, let's turn our attention to the elections. Here's a look at what was at stake on Election Day 2022, one week ago today. The ballots across the country included gubernatorial races in 36 states, including nine of the 12 Midwestern states. That's all the next states except Indiana, Missouri, and North Dakota. Legislative races were on the ballot in 46 states, including uh, 88 of the nation's 99 legislative chambers and 22 of the Midwest 23 chambers. That's all but the Kansas Senate, although even there, there was at least one special election. 85% of the nation's 7,000 plus seats were up, and there were more than 130 ballot measures taken up in 37 states and territories, including 21 in nine Midwestern states. Of course, numerous other local, statewide, and federal races as well, but I'm going to focus on what happened at the state level. As a reminder, this is what the partisan landscape across the Midwest looked like heading into the elections. Republicans enjoyed unified control of state government in six of the region's 12 states, seven if you count Nebraska, and you should. Democrats controlled state government in just one, Illinois, and partisan control was divided in the other four, with Democratic governors and Republican legislatures in three, Kansas, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and a Democratic governor with a split legislature in the fourth, that's Minnesota. All told, Republicans controlled 19 of the region's 20, 22 partisan legislative chambers and more than 60% of the Midwest's 1,747 individual legislative seats going into this year's elections. Coming out, this is what the partisan landscape will look like in 2023. As you can tell at a glance, not only was there no red wave across the nation, but at the state level here in the Midwest, most of the partisan swings that occurred this year favored Democrats. While Republicans did post net seat gains in several Midwestern states and will continue to hold a solid majority of all seats across the region next year, partisan control of three individual legislative chambers, the Minnesota Senate and both the House and Senate in Michigan flipped in favor of Democrats. While Democrats last controlled the Michigan House and the Minnesota Senate as recently as 2016, they haven't been in charge in the Michigan Senate since 1983. Only one other legislative chamber across the country, the Pennsylvania House, changed hands this year, although final results are still pending in at least uh, four other chambers. Meanwhile, all eight incumbent governors seeking re-election in the Midwest, including five Democrats and three Republicans, won their races. And Republican Jim Pillen was victorious in the region's only open gubernatorial election in Nebraska, where he will succeed outgoing governor, uh, Republican Pete Ricketts. So there was no partisan change at all among Midwestern governors this year, which means that again next year, the region will be led by seven Republican and five Democratic chief executives. <clears throat> the net result of all this was that the number of Midwestern states under unified partisan control grew from eight, counting Nebraska, to 10 with Republicans at the helm in seven states and Democrats in three. Only Kansas and Wisconsin, both with Democratic governors and Republican legislatures, will remain under divided partisan control next year. As you'll see on this table, uh, uh, Republicans will control 16 of the region's 22 partisan legislative chambers in 2023, with Democrats in control of the other six. And the gubernatorial lineup remains unchanged, except, as I mentioned, in Nebraska. As I also mentioned, there were a number of constitutional amendments and voter referendums appearing on Midwestern ballots uh, again this year. Among the more interesting results, Michigan voters approved a proposed constitutional amendment explicitly protecting the right to abortion, making that state the first in the Midwest to do so. Illinois voters approved an amendment guaranteeing workers' rights to collective bargaining, and Iowa voters added a right to bear arms in their constitution. North Dakota became the fifth Midwestern state to adopt term limits when voters there approved one of the strictest term limit laws in the nation. Under the new provision, lawmakers will be subject to an eight-year lifetime cap on service in each chamber. Meanwhile, Michigan voters tweaked their term limit law by approving an amendment that reduces the lifetime legislative service limit from 14 to 12 years, but now allows all of those years to be served in a single chamber, 
thus effectively doubling the previous limit on service in the House of Representatives, which was capped at just six years. Proposals to legalize the use of marijuana were rejected in both Dakotas this year, as was a Kansas measure that would have altered the balance of power between the executive and legislative branches by giving lawmakers the authority to revoke or suspend executive branch rules and regulations. South Dakota will soon become the region's 10th state to expand uh, its Medicaid program, all but Kansas and Wisconsin and the Midwest have done so, thanks to a citizen-initiated measure approved there. And Nebraska voters approved a measure that will raise that state's minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2026, with automatic cost of living increases in subsequent years. And various proposed election reforms were on the ballot in at least three Midwestern states as well, with voters approving a photo ID requirement in Nebraska, the use of early voting and ballot drop boxes in Michigan, and an Ohio proposal limiting voter eligibility to citizens who are at least 18 years old and who have been legal residents and registered voters for at least 30 days prior to an election. One final footnote on the election front, nationwide more than 40% of the 6,278 legislative seats that were up for election this year failed to attract candidates from both of the two major parties. And the no contest rate was even higher in at least seven Midwestern states. Not a good sign to those who believe a healthy democracy depends on competitive elections. Looking ahead, here's a list of some of the issues, including both unfinished business and new initiatives that are likely to shape fall veto sessions in a few of our states, like Michigan, Ohio, and Illinois, as well as the new sessions that will begin across the Midwest in January. You'll be relieved to know I'm not going to go through these in any de detail. I'll just say that if the past is prologue, you can reasonably expect a number of the big issues that were taken up this year to again uh, be at or near the top of legislative agendas next year. Issues like budgets and taxes, education, criminal justice, health care, abortion, of course. Uh, and here's, uh, here's a sampling of some of the many other issues that uh, we're expecting to see taken up, as well as an indication of some of the states where uh, they're likely to be addressed. Election reform in Iowa and Wisconsin, sports betting in several states, including these three, mental health again, workforce development, and of course, uh, many others. I warned you it was going to be fast. That's my rapid fire overview of recent developments in the Midwest. And uh, thank you again. It's always a pleasure to be here. I wish you the best as your meeting continues. Wow.